instead of having to take a melatonin supplement, eliminating desserts, eliminating alcohol, right? These things can be sleep disruptors, watching your caffeine intake, maybe cutting it off at 12 o'clock, not having that two, three or four o'clock um, caffeine um, boost. So these are some behaviors um, that I do recommend when we're trying to do that, along with magnesium glycinate is a fantastic supplement for many people that does relax the nervous, the central nervous system. Some people like to take some CBD oil. It does help some people. So there's so many different methodologies, but in terms of nutrition, I do like to recommend some herbs. And if you do need a snack to have something that is supportive of sleep, like melatonin or tryptophan in Turkey or <laughs> kiwis actually have some serotonin in it, which relaxes you. So going for a healthy food, not an ice cream treat or something that people often reach for when they're feeling anxious about going to bed. Welcome to Nutrition Without Compromise, a podcast brought to you by Orlo Nutrition. We believe that nutrition shouldn't be an either or, that you should never have to sacrifice your morals for your health or that of our home planet. Join natural products veteran Karina Belizzi and experts from around the globe as they discuss healthy solutions that are better for you and better for the planet. Welcome to another interview episode of Nutrition Without Compromise. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi. As we kick off today's episode, remember that when we dig into the science of nutrition and health, that this show is offered for informational purposes only. If you have a specific health concern, you'll want to connect with your healthcare provider. You're in for a real treat today as I introduce you to a well-versed registered dietitian who has a ton of experience guiding people through all sorts of health challenges, from those that seek to lose weight to those that are working to get the most out of their physical performance as elite athletes. Her name is Amy Shapiro, and she operates out of New York City with her company, Real Nutrition NYC. She has been in private practice for 15 years and loves conversations about nutrition like the one we'll have here today. She offers realistic recommendations on how people like you can meet your nutrition goals and receive better health through better nutrition. As we connect with her today, we're going to focus in on what you can do to nourish your body best so you can recover from stress, sleep, better and feel better, especially if you're one of the many that are suffering from symptoms of long COVID. We have a lot to cover today, so I'm going to jump right in with Amy Shapiro. I've given the audience a taste of what you're all about, but of course, this is just the beginning of the story. Why don't you share with us what brought you into this world of nutrition and why you're so passionate about supporting people specifically as it relates to the food and the things that they ingest? Absolutely. So I grew up in a health food household before it was cool. Uh, my dad owned multiple health food stores. He's worked in the vitamin supplement business since I was a baby. Um, and like the expo, you know, Expo East. Oh, yes. I was there. Yeah, I was there when they're <laughs> like when I was six, when there were only 5000 vendors. And now you probably know there's over 85,000 vendors. So mm -hmm. I really grew up in this world. Um, and just like many other people growing up with it forced on you, you kind of hate it. Right. Um, so I avoided it. I didn't study it. I also didn't want to go to school, undergrad and study all the sciences that it requires to become a dietitian. But eventually, after working eight years in corporate, um, I went back to school because I just couldn't shake it. And I also recognized I was living this healthy life um, because it was in, you know, ingrained in me. And I, I really said to myself, I wake up feeling good every day. And I think people can feel so much better, but they don't know how much better they can feel. And it doesn't have to be that hard. And that was really my drive because um, helping people feel great is really motivating. But I think that when we focus on the basics, it really does a, 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 gives you a huge boost to your energy and then you're motivated to do it. So that's really why I love helping people because I know that food works to make you feel better. I know proper nutrition really can help you make to feel better. Um, and that is my passion. Um, and by the way, my dad is still in the industry in his mid seventies and we now go to Expo East together. 
I might know him. I've been going to those <laughs> shows might. since 1999. So <laughs> he's in the vitamin <laughs> supplement area, not called. the fun food stuff. But yeah, no, I mean, I've yeah, worked so. in the space of health and nutrition, specifically in omega threes and yeah. also other supplements um, for the entirety of my career fun. since 99. So it's what part of why we're talking here about nutrition <laughs> without compromise, right? So <clears throat> let's talk about great nutrition for stress, better recovery from the assaults that we confront, whether it be something like a cold or a flu or just the, the effect of stress so that we can get better sleep, so that we can recover better, so that we can wake up with that spring in our step, just like you were talking mm -hmm. about. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's a whole host of things. And I think that even without those um, quote unquote ailments that you mentioned, I think people aren't getting as much sleep as they need and aren't feeling mm -hmm. as good as they can feel on the baseline, right? Um, and I think that once we can do that, then after we get hit by anything that creates inflammation in the body or illness in the body, we can recover better if we have a strong baseline to start with. So what does a baseline look like? What do you think the fundamentals are that we need to be sure that we're just taking care of checking off that list every day? Well, you know, I always say we start with the basics that nobody wants to start with because they're boring. And everybody's like, oh, but I know that. And I say, well, if you know it, how many people are doing it, right? So when I go give corporate lectures, that's one of the first questions I ask, especially when I talk about hydration, which is key. Um, and everybody rolls their eyes when I'm like, you know, you got to meet your hydration goals. They know, but nobody's doing it. Mm -hmm. So um, the basics, I would say one is at adequate hydration with clean water um, and sometimes adding electrolytes or a little bit of, you know, uh, sea salt if you need some in the morning to help your cells actually get that hydration. And it's really important to hydrate before we caffeinate, which is something other people don't like when I say that. They roll their eyes again at me because we are dehydrating overnight. We're drinking coffee, which that is a diuretic. We're maybe drinking alcohol, which is a diuretic. And so we're walking around pretty much dehydrated, which means our organs aren't functioning at their highest level. So that's my first, right? Once my clients start to drink adequate amounts of water, their pep is back in their step, even if they're not doing anything else. And that's usually rule one. Um, and then of course, you know, moving on from there, which it's a chore for a lot of people to drink enough water. And I always just say my baseline really is um, half your body weight in ounces, give or take where you live, how much you exercise, um, all of those types of things. But then we got to look at the fruits and vegetables, which again, most adults are not meeting their fruit and vegetable goals, um, which means they're not meeting their fiber goals, right? So we want to eat fruits and vegetables. But even to back up a little bit, I would even say eating three meals a day, right? Mm -hmm. Snacks in between if you want, but a lot of people push past breakfast. Ah, I don't need it. I'm too busy. It's easy for me to bypass this. I'll just wait until lunch. Um, but once you cut out an entire meal, you already are losing really important nutrients like fiber and calcium, antioxidants, um, you know, disease fighting nutrients. So it's really, I think, getting people to eat Right. And then what you're putting on your plate, which you know, dives into all of the specifics. But those are your baseline, um, along with living an active life, which given COVID, many of us have stopped moving, commuting, doing things. And we sit and sit and sit and sit. And everybody underestimates how um, your activities of daily living really do enhance your lifestyle. So I want to unpack a couple of things because yeah, I sure. think that you just shared a lot. Um, one of the issues that we started with is hydration, right? Yes. And I've listened to a couple of podcasts that you've guested on in the marathoning space. So mm. I have experience in um, running marathons myself. I'm no longer a distance athlete. Um, but I will tell you that, you know, some simple changes occur when you go through all these training initiatives. Like if you're exercising a lot and sweating yeah. a lot, I had a simple tell my salt in my, um, I, you know, I, I'd go ahead and take a shower after a, a hard training run. And I knew I needed a lot more salt, um, or just electrolytes in my system when my sweat would literally start to not be salty anymore. Mm -hmm. And so yes. it was an indicator for me that I needed to make sure that I was getting more salt in my diet because of the fact that I was running 60 to 80 miles a week in training. Right. I mean, Absolutely. that's a lot of distance that you're putting on your feet each and every week, which 
incidentally is why I no longer am a distance athlete. I, I have some um, running inspired injuries, mostly bunions, which just start to aggravate me after about the sixth mile. I don't like running less than eight miles. So I stopped running, right? So now I do a lot of hiking and I still mm. do a lot of weights and things like that. I'm getting outdoors and I'm getting my cardio because I do a lot of hills and and even just the way I weight lift is getting yes. me that cardio. Mm. I still use that as an indicator because it's something I learned early on. If my sweat starts to get less salty, it's an indicator for me that I need to add more electrolytes. And that could be eating the banana that gives me potassium or being just a little bit more liberal with a bit of table salt or even taking an electrolyte supplement. So mm -hmm. what are your go-tos for people to ensure that they get adequate nutrition from that water baseline? Because that's just such an important baseline to start with. Yeah. So, you know, if we're, if, if you're running, if you're sweating a lot, and I usually say we don't require um, any electrolytes if we are exercising or sweating, you know, for an hour or less, but once we hit the 90 minute mark, we really do, do try to incorporate that um, give or take, of course, the environment that you're in. Um, so I always say that, but I would say eating a balanced Diet is going to provide you with most of the electrolytes that you need. Um, if many people who are on a low carbohydrate diet or a keto diet tend to be lower in salt and sodium, so they typically will feel better um, when they do add sodium as their electrolyte or as part of their electrolyte packet or equation. Um, potassium is great to add through, fruit, you know, fruits and vegetables like bananas or avocado. But if you're losing the salt in your sweat, then potassium isn't what you need. You've lost all your salt. So you have to make sure that you're consuming the sodium piece. Um, I like to recommend things that either are part of your food, but when you are sweating at that level and you do need quick um, electrolyte delivery. That's where I like to add it into your water. Um, I don't know if I can name any brands um, on here. I don't work with any, but um, in terms of there are certain electrolyte powders that I do like that don't have any added sugars, no artificial colors, no artificial or natural flavors. Um, so I do like those uh, cleaner brands. And mm -hmm. I usually say, you know, over an hour is a good time to add them if you are you know, working out at that kind of level as yeah. a average person who's in the office and they just want to add it. Sometimes it helps because it enhances the flavor of your water and encourages you to drink more. And like I said earlier, it does help your cells to actually take up the water so you can hydrate on the cellular level as well. Right. Now the second somewhat controversial topic, I don't think this mm. should necessarily be controversial, but you mentioned breakfast, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. There's so many people today that are starting to hear about things like intermittent fasting. And so they're going, you know, sometimes 12, 16, 18 hours without consuming anything. And they're skipping the breakfast for that reason and may not be consuming anything after 7 p.m. in the evening as well. So mm -hmm. what do you say to that individual who's practicing something like intermittent fasting for health applications? Yes, absolutely. So I think that intermittent fasting is act, is absolutely a wonderful, healthy application for most people. People who are doing intermittent fasting correctly are getting all the nutrients that they need within their eating window, right? That's why it works. That's why they feel good. That's why it's, it's encouraging them to continue to do that. So individuals who are intermittent fasting and know how to properly intermittent fast are not lacking their nutrients because they're making sure that they are building their day with the nutrition that they need. Mm -hmm. Many people who say, I'm going to try fasting are trying to do it as a weight loss um, endeavor mm -hmm. because it's easy to skip a meal, but you know, they will skip a meal and wait and then they'll, you know, start with, you know, pizza. And I'm not saying pizza is bad, but you know, less healthy, more processed <laughs> foods just because it gives them that opportunity to eat it. And then they'll stop eating at 11 o'clock at night. Right. And then try to, you know, so they're not always doing it with, how can I make sure that within my eating window, I'm really getting the most nutrition for my body? So, so in that case, they're not even using the benefit of a body's natural circadian rhythms because they're correct. eating so late before they're going to Or they're to just bed. trying to use it to help themselves yeah. cut off a certain time. So therefore, I always say, you know, if you're going to do it in that way, I'd rather you not even do it because we can meet those goals in a different way. So mm -hmm. if you are intermittent fasting, making sure you're getting in all the nutrition you need is the essential piece. So it's not about cutting calories and having less, which you probably know. Um, but for the audience, it is about getting all the calories you need for that day to support your metabolism and your health and your sleep and your rhythms um, from the food that you need just within a shortened window. 
Yeah. Now to meet my health objectives specifically because I do lift a fair amount of weight too, Mm -hmm. I've been given a diet guideline from my personal trainer of having 40% of my calories from protein and then 30 from carbs, 30 from fat. So fairly balanced across the board, Mm -hmm. but with a little bit more protein, because again, I want to be building muscle, a healthy lean body mass while also limiting my fat production. So this doesn't sound like crazy talk, I think, to any registered dietitian I've spoken to, but I have seen many extreme diets that are gaining traction that are are a bit possibly fad. And I'm I'm Mm -hmm. thinking specifically of the carnivore diet when I say this, Mm -hmm. but um, also keto sometimes and the way people are applying it and and some other more fad-oriented diets out there. Why do you think that these trends don't work for the long term. Like they might work for a short window, but for the long term, don't deliver the best health outcome. Well, first of all, these are extreme diets, right? (laughs) And in my practice and what I've seen and what I believe and what I know is that nothing extreme really, A, can work or be maintained long term. So there are just certainly people who live a carnivore lifestyle and that is fantastic or are fully in ketosis and know how to manage it. But again, just like the intermittent fasting, they are all in. They are you know, probably taking the right supplements and all of the things, which most of the people who are reading about it and then trying it themselves are not working with a professional to go to that level. With that being said, I do not recommend the keto diet unless you have epilepsy. So um, clinically, that's you know, it's just not proven. Regardless, you will get results because you are cutting out an entire food group. Mm -hmm. If you cut out all of your carbs, you lose all of the water that's stored in your muscles when you use up the stored glucose and glycogen. Um, So you lose this very quick, rapid weight loss, uh, water weight. But it's very difficult. And then, you know, you go through the keto flu symptoms and all these things where you feel pretty crappy. So most people don't even sustain that part because once you start to feel bad, you don't want to stick to it anymore, but you have to get through that. So anyway, I think they're short term. I think the results are there. But then what happens when the holiday party comes up or when your friends want to go out to dinner, when your kids have a birthday party, right? So they're not lifestyle choices. So my approach is very lifestyle focused because my clients have kids. They want to go out to dinner. They want to travel. They want to do all of these things. So lifestyle, extreme diets are not lifestyle driven. Um, That's why they don't really work long term and why I don't recommend them unless there is some sort of clinical a medical issue, reason why I should be. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they're not diet tools because ultimately you may lose some weight, but what are you doing to your heart health? What are you doing to your blood pressure? What are you doing to your bones? You know, what are you doing to all the other systems in your body when you're removing an entire food group? So let's come back then to some of the earlier positioning conversation about getting better sleep and supporting your nutrition. There um, is quite a trend around consuming magnesium, sometimes even taking a supplementary magnesium to both Mm -hmm. enable your muscles to relax and also to aid in sleep. Are there other specific nutrition tools that you like to point people to if they might say, you know, I'm just having trouble getting a solid seven hours or more of sleep a night? Yeah. So I always start with, you know, behaviors, um, Stop drinking your liquids a certain hour, you know, two or three hours before you go to sleep. So you're not interrupting your sleep and by having to go to the bathroom, which can be very disruptive, um, that your room is cold, that you stop eating. I always, I truly recommend not consuming food about two to three hours prior to bed. So your body has the ability to not focus on digestion, but to help with sleep repair and recovery instead of putting its energy towards digestion. Um, Not having big meals, right? So you're not getting any discomfort, acid reflux. So there are those basic things that I do recommend that, believe it or not, when I speak with my clients, these are things that a lot of people aren't doing. They're coming home from work late. They're eating their biggest meal at the end of the day. They're, you know, going to sleep right after they, you know, so all of these things, so they're, they're very basic. Again, we're talking about the basics, but those really do help. Um, and then I do recommend some, some things like tea, right? You can use some certain herbs, but tea is a really nice, um, I always like to say it's a nice sleepy behavior, right? It gets you I'm having my tea. I know I'm going to bed soon, even though I did mention cutting the liquids, if that's a piece for you, but you can do something like the lemon balm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The lemon balm or chamomile. These are very um, soothing herbs that you can just take with um, tea. If you do need to eat something, sometimes people do benefit from eating something, something like having almonds before bed because they are rich in melatonin. Mm -hmm. Um, 
instead of having to take a melatonin supplement, eliminating desserts, eliminating alcohol, right? These things can be sleep disruptors, watching your caffeine intake, maybe cutting it off at 12 o'clock, not having that two, three or four o'clock um, caffeine um, boost. So these are some behaviors um, that I do recommend when we're trying to do that, along with magnesium glycinate is a fantastic supplement for many people that does relax the nervous, the central nervous system. Some people like to take some CBD oil. It does help some people. So there's so many different methodologies, but in terms of nutrition, I do like to recommend some herbs. And if you do need a snack to have something that is supportive of sleep, like melatonin or tryptophan in Turkey or <laughs> kiwis actually have some serotonin in it, which relaxes you. So going for a healthy food, not an ice cream treat or something that people often reach for when they're feeling anxious about going to bed. So let's talk for a moment about the why behind not the sugar and not the alcohol, especially yeah. in the last few hours before you go to bed. Um, mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about why that is such a challenge? To the sleep, absolutely. So what happens is when we have dessert or when we have alcohol, typically what happens is we do get this blood sugar spike, right, which gives you a little bit of energy or even if it's not giving you that boost of crazy energy, it gives you the spike. But then once it drops, your blood sugar drops and that can disrupt and wake you up from sleep. Um, mm -hmm. So that tends to happen with both alcohol and sweet foods at night if you are sensitive to it, right? It's almost like a little bit of a sugar high, um, but also with that glass of wine, which does immediately kind of relax you, right? When your blood sugar drops, it does dis disturb and disrupt your sleep. Um, and so, so that's, that's why, why people, those... if they have too much alcohol, will likely wake up at two or three in the morning if they've gone to right. bed like a couple mm -hmm. hours before or something to that effect. Correct. It's easy to fall asleep, but it will dis it can, I should say, it can disrupt your sleep. Yeah. Um, and then often we know that too much alcohol goes hand in hand with not as healthy food sources. So that could also disrupt your sleep there too. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I did not know that almonds were a good source of melatonin. Now, mm -hmm. given that you've introduced melatonin and we've talked a little bit about magnesium, yeah. um, I've actually often had the question from people, given that we often speak of omega-3s on this show, yeah. um, about whether or not they should take that in the morning or in the evening. I wonder if you have an opinion on when they should get their omega-3 supplements. So my opinion with supplements is really, when are you going to remember to take them? Um, it's it's also, also, I mean, it sounds like I'm talking to a mirror at this point, because that's usually what my response is, whenever it's right? easiest it's, for you to remember. But uh, I, unless it's something that's going to give you energy, which therefore will interrupt your sleep, right? Yeah. Vitamin D, we should take in the morning and those. But so for me personally, I like to take omegas um, before I go to bed, um, because that's just when I take them because I leave them right by my toothbrush. I don't need to take them with food. I, I just, that's when I take mine. But well, and you're I resting many, and repairing, right? So that's when right, your cells so are getting all absorbing. of that. Yeah. Correct. So that's when I personally take them and when I recommend most of my clients taking them. Um, and also a lot of individuals are concerned about not feeling well when they take a supplement, which, mm -hmm. you know, most people don't have any negative effects with omega-3s that I know of, except for some if they're burping up something. Um, but I well, and if they're taking the Orlo, that. they won't have that experience because it's in that polar lipid form. So um, this is a complaint I've heard from people when they did take uh, fish oil at night. Yes. That sometimes they'd feel almost like not heartburn per se, but they'd feel it kind of like the... Um, it's an aldehyde byproduct if you want to get really specific, but mm. it's even if it's not um, fishy, that they're just kind of feeling it come up a little bit yes. or having a bit of a taste in their mouth. And if you're consuming your omega-3 in a polar lipid form, it just gets easily integrated in the tissues. You don't need to consume it with food because it doesn't need any co-products in there to help absorb it either. So you can easily take it right before bed and get the benefits of the omega-3s helping you rebuild overnight. I love that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So if you are not taking that, which I am encouraging more and more of my clients to, um, then I just think nighttime is a safe bet 
because you're yeah. kind of like, okay, I'll take it and then I'll go to sleep and I won't have to worry about it. But. <laughs> well, and if you have something on your bedstand, there's a um, question about when people should consume things like a probiotic or a prebiotic if they're also supplementing. Now, I know mm-hmm. some are shelf stable. What, what do you guide your, um, your clients to do in that case? So I like to recommend that my clients take their probiotic on an empty stomach um, before they eat their first meal or, you know, if they've gone a decent amount of time before they go to bed or something like that. Again, priority is when will you remember to take it? And if they're not shelf stable, right, if they are in the fridge and it has to be a little bit more strategic. Mm -hmm. In terms of a prebiotic, you know, if it's a symbiotic probiotic that you're taking where they're they're both in in one dose, um, then again, you can take that. But ideally, I'm encouraging my clients to eat a high prebiotic, high fiber diet. So ideally, mm-hmm. their their diet is just naturally um, rich in prebiotics, which will help to feed those probiotics and um, help them to proliferate and stay healthy and make everything hum right along. So we incorporate prebiotics in our food recommendations. Um, but mostly, I tell people to take them before yeah. their first meal of the day. Awesome. Um, in a couple of past episodes, one, we interviewed uh, Mark Washington, who started a company called Supergut um, about prebiotics specifically, and they're producing products to do that service. So how would you guide people to eat to ensure that they're getting enough of those prebiotics in, let's say, their first meal of the day so that they've got a good base to absorb their nutrition that they consume? Yes. So, um, well, in in every meal, I recommend individuals consume some sort of fiber and protein and, of course, a heart-healthy fat, right? So the breakdown that your trainer recommended, some version of that. So Mm -hmm. whether you're eating, let's say, a uh, Greek or plant-based yogurt with some chia seeds and some berries in there, you have your prebiotics happening in that meal. Um, Throughout the day, you're going to be eating roughage, greens, vegetables, resistant starch from maybe some already cooked and then chilled potatoes, some, um, you know, not overly ripe bananas. Um, and then of course, you know, and I don't know why I'm categorizing these as lunch or dinner because many people eat cooked vegetables at lunch. I just personally don't always, um, you know, your asparagus, your artichoke, your hearts of palm, these foods that do are high in this resistant starch, which are the prebiotics. So it's really slipping it through the day. So A, it helps with your digestion. You're not loading yourself up with fiber in one in one meal and then it sits and has to go, you know, it can get in the way of easy digestion, but you're distributing it throughout the day. So of course, when we have a healthy gut microbiome, because we're constantly feeding our microbiome with prebiotics, It doesn't necessarily matter if it's right at that breakfast when you take your probiotic because it's just over the course of the day. So, But I do always encourage some healthy fiber at your first meal. I should say first meal because we discussed how not everybody eats breakfast, but to support that. Awesome. Now, this sits well with a recommendation that Mia Sin made. Um, She is also a registered dietitian, and she likes to convert people from, let's say, a sweet breakfast or first meal of the day to something more savory. Mm -hmm. So more savory foods tend to also be higher in fiber. I'm picturing, you know, that artichoke integrated into a frittata Mm. or something along those lines, which I mean, honestly has my tummy rumbling right now because I've yet to have my first meal of the day. (laughs) So I'm curious to know, um, you know, something that you mentioned in your intake form was debunking myths. Mm. I wondered if you had Any particular myths that you think deserve debunking? And then I have a few of my own to cover. Well, one that I find myself talking about a lot is the um, alternative plant milks. So Mm. there's a lot of debunking um, in terms of oat milk, which I just, as much as we talk about it, and, you know, it's just that everyone thinks that it is a healthier option. And even if you're not, you know, allergic to dairy or with, not eating dairy. It's just the healthier option. Just today, I took my first call after dropping my kids off at school and I was in a coffee shop and I sit there mesmerized every single morning when I go get my coffee about how many people are ordering oat milk and they don't even know why they're ordering it, but they're doing it because it's just taken. So that's my biggest myth debunker that I'm constantly talking about, um, especially because most people aren't buying their own and making sure the ingredients are clean. Mm-hmm. Um, and also well, and they might not people 
It has fat in it, right? Where's the fat coming from? It's not coming from, from the, the oils. oils. So they're the adding seed, seed oils. oils. So, I mean, yeah. this is one of those things, especially I love this topic because people don't necessarily <sighs> understand how they're so out of whack with their omega-3 to omega-6 ratios. Oh, yes. And it's because they are... The, even when they make a choice to have a healthy salad, they're using a salad dressing that is made with canola oil or soybean oil, seed or, oil. and it's all omega-6. And then yeah. they're going and they're getting their Starbucks oat milk latte because they hear that dairy's bad for some reason. And they've Correct. made that choice, even though they don't know if they're sensitive. I personally am sensitive to dairy. And I learned this through trying to help my younger son figure out what he's allergic to. I didn't want to have his blood tested when he was so young. So I had mine tested mm -hmm. to find out mm -hmm. I'm pretty dairy sensitive <laughs> and I yeah. probably always knew, but I love dairy. So I've since yeah. cut it out. I do make my own oat milk and also an almond milk at home. Every once mm -hmm. in a while I buy the stuff from the store, but I'm also reading my ingredient labels and being mindful that when I get the store bought one and it has fat and it is probably an omega six. So I think about it and I Especially work in oat. Yeah. Right. So they're adding um, omega six to that. Yeah. Um, and then they also, if you think about the other ingredients in there, often they are using emulsifiers of some sort and you Certainly. may or may not have digestive trouble from that emulsifier. Um, um, yeah. So it's just <sighs> label reading and then also is important. If not organic oats, right. Then you're getting glyphosate. Right. And so this is just, but, and it's, so this is one of my biggest myths. And I feel like no matter how much I put it out there or how much it's written about, because oat milk, we can all agree that it tastes probably the most rich, right? For all the reasons that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. It's it's like one of those I'm just ignoring. And what I say all the time, and you probably feel the same, is that often with an unhealthy, if something comes up or you don't feel well, or if you're, you know, it's not the one-off big holiday dinner that you had. Sure, in the moment you might have some indigestion, but it's the habits that we do every single day that really create right the constant consumption of omega-6s, which throw off our balance to our omega-3s. Every single day, people get their coffee maybe twice a day. So these are the things that just really rile me up. <laughs> yeah, or if you're me, that's I drink a popular. lot of coffee. <laughs> so um, I love coffee. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's my beverage of choice. I also drink tea. I drink a lot of water too. So I am working to balance that. Um, okay. So I have another one for you. A okay. calorie is a calorie. Absolutely disagree with that. <laughs> well, well, so yes. And that's kind of goes in with my intermittent fasting, but starting your fast with pizza or some other processed junk food. Yeah. So I think this gets back to nourishing your body. But um, if if you were to consume, let's say, the standard, which you all of our nutrition percentages are based off a, a 2000 calorie diet, which mm -hmm. would be far too much food for some people and not enough for somebody else. So again, this is another myth, right? We all yes. need 2000 calories. Not true. Um, so if we're looking at that 2000 calorie diet, just as a baseline, and you were to consume something that was much more rich in prebiotic fibers, a lot of vegetables, and you compared that to a piece of cake, mm -hmm. these are not the same. One is no. going to actually stimulate your metabolism to work efficiently. And the other is going to give you a huge glycemic spike, which may actually encourage your body to hold on to water and also hold on to fat, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And it just starts to mess with your hormones, right? The glycemic spike leads to a crash, which leads to mm -hmm. a spike, which leads to a crash. And that affects a whole nother system in our body. So yes, Absolutely. But also and you also probably... negatively mm -hmm. it negatively affects your immune health. So if we're looking right. at this whole picture of getting better sleep, of ensuring that you're handling stress well, and also making sure that you have a healthy immune system so that you don't get COVID that second or third time. I'm, he I'm hearing in my community from people yes. who've had COVID already two or three times and who are suffering from some of the long COVID symptoms like restless, um, inability to sleep nice. through the night, um, having inflammation in different spots of their body, pain. Um, I mean, it, the, the list is quite long. So yes. it's just, you know, if you seek to educate yourself a little bit, 
if we start to look at nutrition as nourishment and what mm -hmm. is giving your body as opposed to just a simple calorie, then I think we're doing a much better job. And that's where people like you, experts can offer such incredible service to your clients and help them navigate that and get to a space where a calorie is a calorie is debunked from their entire mind and where perhaps they follow more of a plant-based diet as well, because they start to understand that you can get so much of what your body needs from vegetables and fruits. You reach that three to five servings much more easily a day of those key things that are going to nourish your digestion and also provide micronutrients to support your health and balance your hormones. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you're getting the protein you need, not only from the vegetation, but also from anything supplementary that you consume, whether it be a protein shake or, you know, if you're a meat eater, meats um, and other vegetarian sources like beans and things along those lines. A few weeks ago, we had Dr. Foreman on this show. Mm -hmm. um, he talks specifically about getting to a mostly vegetarian whole foods diet to support long-term health. And he works in his practice to get people off of the three to five and more medications that they might be on as they navigate these health challenges and mm -hmm. do so much of that work through nutrition and starting yes. there. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the conversation becomes a little bit difficult because people are afraid to give up their favorite things, right? And mm -hmm. if they, they think it's almost all or nothing. But I also think the beauty of fresh fruits and vegetables is the way that they easily just crowd things out, right? And we also have to remember that our portions have gotten so much bigger of these, you know, not calorie equal foods, right? Mm -hmm. Cake and fast foods and all these things. The portions now are really big versus what they used to be. But when we can add, you know, more of this, probably like Dr. Furman's doing, you know, we can add more. So you're not walking around miserable and hungry, but you're crowding out the unhealthy food. So there's still, you know, many of my clients are never going to go without their favorite X, Y, Z, but it's a little bit more sustainable if they don't walk around feeling hungry and they can feel like there are other healthy choices that can help to, um, instead of make them eliminate more so crowd out the unhealthy food. So right. that's something well, I like to discuss. I'm with you there. I um, mm -hmm. used to travel a lot by airplane. Um, yes. And thankfully, I'm not doing so much of that anymore for numerous reasons. One is certainly leaving a greener footprint on this earth. Yes. Um, but I often would travel with my own food and bring a few key things with me. So I didn't grab the, you know, Annie's pretzel or whatever else was offered at the, um, it's a lot of the, we wish it was Annie's airports pretzel. Is, However, yeah. it's not because there's, there's, well, Annie's probably good, but you know, I look at those pretzels and there are those seed oils in them. Yeah, there are a lot of seed oils. And so yeah. again, you're, you're just, you're building your inflammation by overburdening your system with omega-6s, which create pro-inflammatory prostaglandins and undernourishing them with omega-3s, which help to actually quash that inflammation and Absolutely. support your cellular health. Okay. So here's another one that I have heard a few times in the media of late. Um, it's, just that it seems the media likes to report negatively or super positively <laughs> on specific things. So they might say it's like something as simple as there was a meta analysis. Multivitamins don't work. Um, right. Omega threes don't work. Vitamin D doesn't work. I mean, I, I've, I've seen so many of these hits. They're not consistent. One perspective. Or, yes, I know. So what would you say to somebody who says, oh, well, I just saw this study. Supplements don't work. So I'm just not going to take any of them. Well, I'm always going to talk about right as my career. I'm, I will always say, well, then are you absolutely sure that your diet is providing you with all of the nutrition that you need? And one of the things that I'm always recommending as supplementation is omega-3s because most people do not con consume enough, even if they're watching their omega-6s, but most people just do not consume enough of um, complete sources of omega-3s. So is your diet completely balanced? Do you know exactly what nourishment you need to fill all of those gaps, which many of us are not, right? Especially when we talk about vitamin D, which comes from the sun. So unless you're running around naked for 15 minutes every single day in a really warm climate without sunscreen, you know, so I would ask about that first. Um, and then I would say certainly not all supplements are created the same, right? Do your research about 
what supplements actually work, why. Um, I do think the phospholipid, that process is awesome, right? Be- but many people don't even know the difference mm-hmm. if they're reading it. So it's it know what to look for, work with a professional because some supplements, as you know, and I know are not fantastic, but that's probably what's catching the media. But if you know the right ones to take, you know what to look for, that would be my education on it. So I, I hear you, but let me educate you on why. And then I would start with, these are the few that I absolutely think you should take regardless. Yeah. But I'm only making recommendations. I'm not writing prescriptions. Right. That's right. I will point people again to Dr. Foreman's episode on this podcast. He revealed something to me that I hadn't known, even years of working in this industry, um, you know, really saying that he wanted people to look for supplements when it comes to a multivitamin that do not include folic acid, but rather folate, the food form of that particular nutrient. And so many women are told throughout pregnancy and beyond that they need to be sure they're getting folic acid. Acid. And so they look for a supplement that contains folic acid. They, what they need is folate. Folate is in your cruciferous vegetables. It is in some of the more mindful whole food based um, multivitamins that you can find on the market, some of which are blended with probiotics to help you absorb them. But if you're getting your nutrition from a food source, it's generally speaking going to be better absorbed. Um, another myth I hear quite frequently is mm. vegans vegans get enough omega-3 and I could work to debunk this one but the reality is some of the same conversation we had a little bit earlier which mm-hmm. relates to the seed oils so it's just challenging to get enough of the omega-3s in your system if you're eating a fully plant-based diet and not consuming fish two to three times a week Correct. so generally speaking and I'm talking about fish that are low on the food chain that have high levels of omega-3 and that are not farmed. So that's getting more and more challenging to meet those three metrics at the same time that you also understand that we're living in this plastic world and we consume about a credit card's worth of plastic each week. A lot of that is coming from seafood. So (laughs) what's the best choice here? Yeah, it's wild. And, you know, I do, I do. This is why I love Orlo is the fact that, we can now get omega-3s right with with a negative footprint right but also from where the fish get their omega-3s from and therefore it's not just ala which then has to be converted into dha epa right which the chia seeds and the walnuts and the flax aren't officially uh, efficiently converting right um Mm. i think that that's incredible and many people at least my clients um don't know that so i do even though people think that they're getting enough from all the flax and all of their things, which is great, right? It's really good for so many things. Um, Having the, going right to the source, right? Right. Where the fish are getting it and not having to worry about your mercury levels and not have all these other concerns, I think is just incredible. And it's a, um, you know, it's just every, it's in everybody, right? It doesn't matter if you're vegan or vegetarian or eating, drink, whatever it is, it's in everybody, which is, I just am very, it's very exciting. So I know that I'm, a, I know you can appreciate when I'm getting all nutrition nerdy on that, but it's very yeah. exciting. It really well, is. And I, I have always said to people like flax oil is a great nutrition source, but when you go to a flax oil, you should be looking for the high lignin flax oil because yes. that high lignin flax oil, while, while it might have a little bit more of that nutty flavor to it is providing a lot of benefits to you. It can help people. I have seen um, people who consume a fair amount of omega-3 from algae or fish, right? Mm-hmm. But they still have hormonal outbreaks every time they have the yes. period, as an example. Yeah. And when they add uh, high lignin flax oil, it helps to balance hormones, and then they experience less less outbreaks and things like that, which... Absolutely. We, we can all be a little vain, right? We want our skin to be healthy. We don't want the pain of cystic acne or or some other things that are in essentially erupting from our bodies saying that something's out of balance. And a lot of times we can address these things through proper nutrition. I love using flax seeds and flax oils as part of a base in salad dressings because mm-hmm. you can have that healthy oil and you can mix it in with things like pistachios and, and mm. pumpkin seeds and make some really kind of nutty, beautiful salad dressings without going to buy the store-bought stuff. You save money, you get better nutrition, it tastes better. I mean, what more do you want? (laughs) Always. And it's not hard. 
right? I think that's the piece that, that d- deters people. It, it seems to be confusing and hard. But I do think that uh, although when I talk about those seeds we were talking about in terms of omega-3s and how they convert from the ALA, but there are other health benefits. Chia seeds I really like to recommend to people because they do hold on to hydration. They do keep you full. They do help with digestion. So um, they're not, I didn't mean to say that they're not great because but no, they're, they're a great nutrition source, source vegan, high in fiber, you know, right? You know, yes, fantastic. Yeah, and so I, um, I mean, I like to make a chia seed pudding, put a little vanilla extract in that, or almond if I want to, just give it a little extra kick. I use mm-hmm. um, oat milk that I make at home. There's actually a very simple recipe for oat milk that Mia Sin has in her cookbook, um, mostly plant based. That was mentioned in last week's episode, and also is on our blog page for that episode. So I'm, I put that up there. I will tell you, it is so easy to make oat milk if you want to do this on your own. It is so easy. Yeah. Same thing with almond it's, milk. Almond milk is so, so easy to make. So easy. And chia pudding. I just made it, you know, I put pumpkin pie spice in mine. It was delicious. Wow. Well, I have to pause here for a minute because I want to mention yes. an offer for our audience. There is really no time like the present to give your omega-3 levels a big boost with Orlo Nutrition. So I know we've mentioned omega-3s a few times on this show. These lipids are in their polar lipid form. It means that they get right to work in your system. They're easily digested. You don't need to worry about taking them with food. And they're three times more bioavailable than the omegas in fish or other algae oils because of this polar lipid form. They're vegan, they have unsurpassed purity and freshness, and they're documented to be the world's most sustainable source on planet Earth. Now, there are sponsors. They bring you the show every week, and our audience gets an extra 10% off using the coupon code NWC10. For an extra 10% off, just visit orlonutrition.com and enter NWC10 during checkout. This can mean a total savings of up to 37% off as they're presently running a bundled deal that brings you the omega-3 product of your choice, omega-3, DHA, or prenatal DHA, along with Immunity Boost. Now, Immunity Boost offers you spirulina um, that is grown in their unique Icelandic plant. It offers you naturally occurring vitamin B12, along with vitamin D3 in its most bioavailable form. In an aqueous solution, you just spray a couple sprays in your mouth, get all the benefits of the vitamin D, the spirulina, and a smattering of B vitamins to support your health. It's delicious, it's easy, and it's immune supportive. Wow. Okay. So I will stop there for now off the soapbox and we'll talk about this next subject. Um, I wanted to get your view on building better habits by ending your day and starting your day correctly. And we alluded Mm. to this a little bit earlier, but half the battle is really building these healthy habits. So what does your routine look like? End of day, beginning of day. So my morning, um, I'm a I'm a morning person, which I know is annoying to most people. But with three kids and running a business, <laughs> my husband you know, is the the morning person in our house. That <laughs> I I love morning. It makes me very happy, and it's quiet in my house. So um, my morning is I wake up early before everybody, and hot water with the juice of half of a lemon always, and it's got to be the exact temperature. So it's always about twelve to sixteen ounces of that to start while I'm you know, getting things organized for off to school. Some mornings week, I'll get a workout in at that time as well, because there is uninterrupted time. I always say, and people don't, don't always like to hear this, but I feel like morning is borrowed time, right? Mm. The The only thing that you're not getting is extra sleep, but your other people are not disturbing you. So that is what my morning looks like. Um, and then I have my coffee after that, and then I will eat my first meal of the day. So why the lemon with the hot water? You know, I like to get the extra vitamin C in there. Mm-hmm. I don't want tea in the morning. I just want water, but I don't like cold water. It might be because I live in New York and the weather here is just, you know, cold at this time, but <laughs> I like hot liquids. <laughs> um, so I do it for the digestion. I do it for the liver support. I do it for the vitamin C, which is great for immunity, but also great for your skin. Um, and I like the flavor of it. So it's not too intense, but it's just bright enough to give you that energy in the morning. And sometimes when I have the time, which isn't always, I'll put in a slice of ginger to boost that mm-hmm. little digestive fire. But I can't get into the cayenne pepper 
scenario that people like to do in there too, which is a boost of metabolism. I just don't want to start my day that way. Yeah, I, I can feel you. I do like the cayenne yeah. pepper, but I have found a couple of kombuchas that combine lemon, ginger, and that fire mm-hmm. from the uh, cayenne pepper that I cayenne. simply love. They aren't the thing I want to drink first thing in the morning, though, either. So I like the hot liquids. Yeah. Um, I, I also love lemons, and I have two lemon trees. So there's a, uh, an abundant supply at my home. Um, and yes. I throw the whole lemon because I use Meyer lemons, which are a little bit on the sweeter side than the standard yes. lemon. Um, I cut it in half and I will just use the hand juicer to juice it and throw the whole lemon in there with the rind. Now, yes. because of the fact that I know how it's grown, uh, there's Important. no pesticides on that thing. Um, yes, I rinse it, but it's just, I, I don't have to worry about it. And I often will, when I'm done with my water, I will eat the lemon, including the rind. The rind. And so, yeah, and you're getting all those oils in there. That's good. Yeah, the vitamin out. C from that. And, yeah. I, you know, maybe perhaps I'm a freak, but I really do enjoy it. It's like a healthy trait. I know some people will add honey um, to their, uh, this routine, but yes. um if you are going to add honey, be mindful of the fact that it's sugar, it's extra Correct. calories, and yeah. also consider local honey first because that can actually help people battle seasonal allergies, allergies. and things along those lines. Correct. Yeah. Well, I also don't like to start my day with any sugar because once, for many people, once you get that sugar going, it can spiral a whole day's worth of craving sugar or energy bits and starts. So lemon water for me, then coffee with some cinnamon for more blood sugar regulation as well, but no milk. I take it black. Oh my God. I feel like (laughs) you're, you're me in so many ways. So, okay. The coffee I will brew with cinnamon. So just put the cinnamon powder Mm -hmm. directly in the coffee grounds. And the reason that it works this way is it contains this um, phytonutrient called methyl hydroxy chalcone polymer. Um, And Mm. it is the thing that is responsible for its blood sugar modulating activity so that it keeps things more stable. And this is part of the reason it likely is used in so many sweet treats. And we've just integrated Mm. it um, into things like oatmeal cookies and, you know, um, even like a Mexican hot chocolate has a lot of cinnamon in it. Mm. So it actually helps to balance out that potential for a blood sugar spike. So Mm. if you do require a sweet treat, adding a little extra cinnamon is never a bad idea. Mm, Yes, I love that. Um, Yeah, so that's my morning routine. And then my evening routine, again, I guess I just ended with hot liquids. This is a new theme I'm recognizing in myself, but um, I, I prefer to cook food. But in New York City, we do have exposure to lots of dinners out. But I will always try to... Um, not eat two to three hours before bed, but I do have tea. So I kind of bookend my de- my day with hot liquids, but also the tea is very soothing. It's a really nice way to get herbs into your diet without being stressed about them. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes if I'm looking for more immune support, right, if I, I want an elderberry astragalus tea, if I'm looking for just a soothing, calming, more of a lemon balm, if I'm looking for something, you know, that is a little bit more of like a dessert, like a chai kind of experience. Um, so that's pretty much how I end my day. And um, I do try to get seven, at seven, seven hours of sleep. Um, but with three kids, you know, that doesn't always happen. Yeah, I have um, two young boys, so I get that. Now, I um, have to ask a question. Um, Is there a specific reason that you do not like cold water? It must be part of my makeup because I don't like, like on a beach, I will drink hot coffee if I'm on vacation. I have the same thing. It feels like a shock to the system when I have cold water. Yeah. Yeah. Or like iced coffee. I don't understand. Like, I don't understand why people would drink that. I don't understand why it was invented. Hmm. So, but that's why people will ask me like, what should I make for a smoothie? And I'm not a big smoothie person because I think I just prefer, prefer warm food. And I know that, you know, it's nice to digest and all of these things, but I just think it must be part of my composition. And I'm sure that, um, my acupuncturist or, you know, someone else can tell me really why, but that, and it makes my teeth hurt. Yeah, that's a good reason. Yeah. It hurts your yeah. teeth. All right. Now, um, do you have any quick tips or tricks that you'd like to share with our audience um, before we prepare to wrap? Things that can help them save time and build better habits. 
Well, one is to, I always say to be prepared, right? So take a minute before, before your week starts to assess what's coming up, right? You might need to pack some snacks. Are you traveling on an airplane? Should you pack some of your own snacks? Can you meal prep some quick things like making some hard boiled eggs in the morning to, if it's hard for you to get your supplements out, can you just get them organized in little containers so you can grab and go set them up where you are? So it's considering your week is something that I always have my clients, what's coming up? What do we have to look forward to? What might throw a wrench into the plan? So everyone wants to look at the moment, which is great, or look at the meal that they're eating. But if you can consider your day and therefore your week, you can make better choices for balance. So that's a, you know, I know that's not a quick tip because it does take time, but it actually it kind of works and it's a good habit starter. Um, I always say carry snacks in your bag. And I know that we shouldn't be snacking all the time, but better to have something you know you can eat than having to eat said pretzels on a plane or whatever is in your kid's backpack that they got from a friend <laughs> or what you get on the, you know, my kids are older now, so I'm not in as much control. Um, but you know what you can get it on the corner. So to always have something you can eat that you feel good about that can just take the edge off. So when you do get to your meal, you're not showing up completely ravenous and making poor choices. Cause even the healthy of us, you know, if we show up too hungry, we're going to maybe dive head first into the bread basket. Right. So um, I always say have have um, a snack on hand because you never want to show up to your dinner or your next meal too hungry. But that is one of the things most of my clients have a very well stocked desk drawer, diaper bag, snack, purse, backpack um, with a few. Well, and I've even seen some research studies that back that up that say something as simple as eating a small apple and by small apple, I'm something smaller than the size of your fist, yes. right, yes. Um, can actually reduce your total caloric intake at dinner. People just get full Absolutely. sooner. So if you have that snack before you're eating by half hour or so, then, you know, you're going to make more mindful choices. You'll feel full sooner and you aren't as likely to overeat, which, yeah. I mean, it Most makes a lot of sense. Try to yeah, most people try to wait as long as they can, right? Because they, I don't want to waste those calories. It's again, right? Wanting to skip breakfast if I can just forget about that meal. But it's the more balanced your blood sugar is, the less torturous you make your, you know, the better you can walk into a meal and feel you're supporting yourself and making better choices. So I always say, don't be afraid to spoil your, don't be afraid to spoil your appetite, which is probably not what a lot of parents say to their kids on this, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. And I do find too that I travel with apples in my purse because I can hand one to my child or consume it myself if I need a quick snack on the go. And um, they're always much more agreeable when they have had some food. Something. Aren't you? <laughs> yeah. So am I. Yeah. So I understand, you know, the overall theme of this episode has really been about building a good and strong foundation so that you can have success and so that you aren't overstressing yourself and you aren't developing poor habits. So you sleep poorly, so your immune system is in peril. I understand that you offer resources on your site, including what I printed out here, um, oh. the Real Nutrition One Day um, Nutrition Reset, which is available to yes. anybody that subscribes to your newsletter. So I love this. Um, and you do actually have a beautiful picture of some a shake here. So even if that's yes. not your preferred start to the day, um, I think of shakes as a healthy treat or snack or foundational protein supplement. Um, that's how I use them. But mm -hmm. I, I love that you offer some simple recipes in here as well. Uh, so yeah. if sometimes you, want, you just need a one day reset, right, or just build a better habit. So um, they can just go ahead and see that by going to your website, uh, which is realnutritionnyc.com. Um, do you have any other parting words? Well, thank you for having me. I'm super excited about this, at the negative carbon footprint and an all person friendly and digestible and absorbable omega-3 as a nutritionist again nerding out on something like that is very exciting um, mm -hmm. but also just focus on your basics because your basics will get you further than any fad that you read about that's certainly true i've seen it prove time and again over the years so thank you so much for joining me to, today amy this has been awesome thank you for having me it's really been a pleasure
To find out more about Amy Shapiro and her programs or to subscribe to that newsletter and get your own one day nutrition reset, visit realnutritionnyc.com. Or you can also visit her Instagram at Real Nutrition. I follow her there. She gives some incredible information. It's a free resource to you. So check that out as well. If you learned something today, I hope that you'll subscribe to Nutrition Without Compromise on your favorite podcasting platform. While you're at it, please give us a thumbs up, five-star review, and even a written review. All of those things help more people discover the show so that we can help them along their journey as well. Those reviews, those podcast thumbs up, the five stars, they serve as their own kind of podcasting currency. To learn more about what we're doing at Orlo Nutrition to build better nutrition solutions that are better absorbed so that you can reach your best health, visit orlonutrition.com. And again, remember that coupon code is NWC10 for Nutrition Without Compromise an extra 10% off NWC 10 at checkout. There you'll find a page dedicated to this podcast with complete transcripts for every episode and features that you won't find anywhere else, including those recipes I mentioned from last week's episode, connections to Dr. Foreman and his episode as well. This podcast is all about serving you. So if you'd like us to dive deep into specific topics, if you have questions that you'd like to see answered or guests that you want featured, please reach out. You can send us a note on social channels at Orlo Nutrition, or you can send me an email note directly to hello at OrloNutrition.com. As we close today's show, I hope that you'll raise a cup of your favorite beverage as I say my closing words. Here's to your health. Thanks for listening to Nutrition Without Compromise. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to learn more, visit orlonutrition.com and join our mailing list. You'll gain access to complete show notes, features, and informative blogs because nutrition shouldn't be an either-or.